autumn. Slash fall, depending on where you live. The leaves change color, pumpkins and spice take over, things get released, and I was watched of them, turned tables, grammar failing. My top things of fall 2019. As per usual, I will be rambling about things that came out in the last few months that I actually got around to. And what better way to start this off than with a quick... This season dives deeper into the uncomfortable nuances surrounding its homicidal focus, as its characters deal with a variety of curveballs that hit too close to home professionally, socially, and personally, whilst tying in commentary on intense social issues from the time that, to this day, are still unresolved. It's a solid continuation of an already fantastic series that I've literally pulled an all-nighter to binge. I love the more vibrant set and costume designs and the cheesy over-the-top 80s bullshit its narrative leans more heavily into. However, I also think that in the process, it plays a lot more fast and loose with its structure, which in turn leaves some of its characters feeling disappointingly one note, or in some cases, as if they've regressed. I just have very mixed feelings about it. I have my problems, especially with the first half, but overall I really enjoyed it. It's filled with fantastically directed action scenes and mind-bending illusions, with an oddly relevant focus on the way technology can manipulate our view of reality. And of course, Jake Gyllenhaal's performance as Mysterio is an absolute delight. It's a fun time that I think is well worth the ride. It's definitely a solid film, boasting some stunning technical achievements in its animation, with a touching story that does make sense as a continuation, both narratively and thematically, but at the end of the day, I can't help but feel like it's a bit unnecessary. It seems like it's tying together loose ends that didn't need to be tied up. Of course, maybe I'm being blindsided by how well I think the previous film wrapped things up, and I can appreciate everything this one brings to the table, but still. Now, with that out of the way... Invader Zim Mentor to Florpus is an animated movie based on and which continues the story of the cartoon series of the same name written by Yonan Vasquez, that sees Dib Membrane, a 12-year-old boy, finally face off against the show's titular extraterrestrial conqueror once and for all. Invader Zim was one of my favorite cartoons growing up, one I frequently and obnoxiously quoted ad nauseum, thinking its lol random bullshit was the height of comedic genius. Yeah, I was that asshole. And so my nostalgia inevitably played a big part in my enjoyment here. But even so, I fucking loved it. I think it captures the essence of what made the series so iconic without slipping into the same nostalgia traps so many other projects fall into, beyond the obvious name recognition. Its art and animation perfectly replicates that geometrically gothic and cold-hued aesthetic with new software, while giving itself enough room to experiment with the tricks these modern technologies bring. I never hired any of you! It also dips into a darkly comedic tone that revels in the sheer absurdity of its characters and world, hitting the nail on the head with nearly every joke, from the visual gags to the more traditional setups. But it's not like anyone can just walk out the front door. <laughs> Okay, it's not like we can just walk out the front door. It's not so much about edgy non-sequiturs as some seem to remember Invader Zim for, as it is about just being wacky. And whose offbeat humor I think fits in better nowadays with our meme-obsessed sensibilities than it did back in the day. Nobody is as excited for the big celebration as I am. I am not scientifically possible! But maybe that's just me. But what I think I appreciate most about it is the fact that it feels like a proper finale for the series, giving closure to many of its main and even some side characters and the loose ends they were left with. It's pretty cool to see, especially considering how rare it can be for shows like this to actually be given an ending. Enter the Florpus is a nostalgic return to a cult classic I loved every minute of. Carol on Tuesday is an original anime series directed by Shinichiro Watanabe and produced by Studio Bones. About Tuesday, a rich girl running away from home and Carol, a poor busker doing her best to make ends meet as, after a chance encounter, the pair pursue their dreams of making it big in an AI-dominated music industry. Oh, also it's set on Mars? Just before I get into it, it's worth mentioning that the series is stuck in the proverbial Netflix jail, with only the first half of the series being legally available as of recording, so this short ramble will be focusing specifically on what's been officially released. Now, with that in mind, I really like Carol on Tuesday. It's a show full of variety that loves to explore the many facets of its unique world. I think this can most easily be seen in its characters, whose respectively quirky personalities and backgrounds clash in interesting ways. 
Hell, the best episodes for me revolve around the conflicts those simple differences and experience bring with them. And it's also why I think it clicks together better as a slice of life series, exploring their lives and struggles in the sci-fi tinged metropolis, rather than the more plot-heavy structure it leans into later on. Its characters are what make it shine, and the music they make is just as fantastic. Though it certainly has some well-animated performances, its music is an absolute standout, diving into all sorts of styles and genres over the course of the series, and whose every track has its own charm. Personally though, there are two particular songs tied as my favorites, the ED, now, and, of course, It also does a fantastic job of portraying lots of different kinds of people in its story. Watanabe has been quite outspoken about his beliefs about the importance of representation in media, and it shines true in the show's diversity, with characters designed to look like actual people and written with proper personalities instead of stereotyped caricatures. It's a small thing, but it goes a long way. Though, strangely, it can often feel like it throws more gender non-conforming groups under the bus, as their only depictions in it are as an abuser or a joke. An amazing joke, mind you, but a joke nonetheless. I'd like to think this came about by accident rather than anything actively malicious, but it's just jarring to notice, given how well it does in so many other ways. But even with this in mind, Carol and Tuesday, or the first half of it at least, is a fun series full of great tunes. How Heavy Are the Dumbbells You Lift is an anime series directed by Mitsue Yamazaki, produced by Dolgakoba, and based on the manga of the same name written by Yabako Sandrovich and illustrated by Man. That follows Hibiki, a girl who loves to eat, who joins her local gym alongside one of the popular girls at school, after having an existential weight crisis, only to find herself being roped into all sorts of muscle-bound hijinks with a delightful cast of muscle... uh... enthusiasts. This is probably the anime I had the most fun with this season. It's another in a long line of infotainment anime that's just as goofy as it is educational, providing a lot of genuinely helpful tips, tricks, and information about fitness, while also throwing its characters into some of the most over-the-top situations it can muster. It's a strange dichotomy that even its characters frequently get confused by. <laughs> It's this extreme contrast and accompanying awareness that makes it so enjoyable for me. Its sheer passion for the topic even managed to get me back into exercising regularly. Don't look at me like that. Fitness is hard! It's a show that's well aware of what it is and revels in it. Oh Maidens in Your Savage Season is an anime series directed by Masahiro Ando and Takuro Tsukada, produced by Le Deuce, and based on the manga of the same name written by Mario Kata and illustrated by Nao Emoto, that follows the girls of a high school literature club as they stumble their way through all the most awkward parts of teenage life, such as... You know, I wasn't very sure of this show until that scene at the end of episode one. Or should I say, the climax of episode one. Ha ha ha. Ha ha. Ah, yeah, you can unsubscribe now. I would too. Look, when a show's willing to pull something like that, I gotta see where it's gonna go with it, and to places it does indeed go, as it dives headfirst into all the more memorable aspects of teenagerhood, from the high-strung emotions that run rampant through its narrative to the character's sudden realization about everything being a euphemism for some reason. It perfectly captures the chaos that is puberty, with the many ways its characters handle it – rejection, detachment, frustration, confusion, and more confusion – gives the show a wide scope with which to tackle this cringe-inducing subject matter and whose focus mostly on the experiences of a group of girls is a perspective you don't tend to see portrayed that often in anime, or even in media in general. Or at least, not to the same degree. And I think it's only as effective as it is because of those characters. His cast is a well-rounded bunch, each riddled with their own particular puberty-based anxiety, and who in the process of dealing with it both strain and strengthen their relationships with those around them in only the most melodramatic of ways. But as fun as their antics are to watch in their own right, they feel like they've been written with such a strong sense of empathy that makes them and their thought process in dealing with their intertwining situations, fundamentally flawed as it can end up being, understandable and even sympathetic. Though it also has some questionable elements, specifically regarding sexual relationships between adults and minors, some of which I do think play quite cleverly into its narrative by exploring the long-term effects that that kind of manipulation can have on a person, and others... 
I still don't know how to feel about. It's just something to keep in mind if you do decide to give it a go. It's a melodramatic show full of heart and humor that tackles a well-worn subject from a less than common angle. A Short Hike is an indie game developed by Adam Griu that puts you in the shoes of a bird person on, well, a short hike. It's pretty self-explanatory. It's a game that doesn't take too long to beat, with the main goal only taking maybe an hour or so, but there's still plenty to do beforehand. It's full of characters to talk to, collectibles to find, neat areas to explore, and even a few mini-games to obsess over. It might be a small experience, but it's packed with things to do, and it encourages you to take your time. There's no rush, unless you're trying to speedrun it, so why not mess around, play with the flying mechanics, and discover all the little things the game has to offer? It's a relaxing experience, one whose aesthetic gives it a weirdly cozy feel that wraps it all up quite nicely. It's just a really nice game. Astral Chain is a hack-and-slash adventure developed by Platinum Games set in a world where interdimensional creatures called Chimera hunt down the last remnants of humanity living in a megacity known as the Ark, as you take on the role of a mildly customizable detective of the police's neuron department, using tamed Chimera called Legion to protect and serve. For as much as I did end up enjoying this game, it took quite a while to get into, but once it clicked I was hooked. Or chained, I guess? Its gameplay is based around fighting with two characters, you and one of five Legion, each with their own unique powers and abilities, including, of all things, a motherfucking JoJo reference, and which the game takes advantage of for some interesting mechanics that build off of this dual-pronged approach, from the synced attacks that can be unleashed with well-timed button presses to using the titular chain to trap enemies or send them flying. Granted, I felt like it devolved into button mashing very easily, but even then, there's still a method to its madness. It is complicated, but it does ease the player into it, starting off with just one legion to get the hang of things before throwing more your way as the game progresses. As hard as it can be to get into, it's a solid system with lots of fun ins and outs to fiddle with. I also felt similarly about its story. At first, I couldn't really latch onto anything, seeing it as just standard JRPG stuff whose inspirations are a little too obvious, but its characters were endearing and I liked just experiencing its world. I never thought I'd end up being so entertained by throwing away empty cans, or so infuriated by unreasonable amounts of motion-controlled ice cream. But its plot slowly escalated, bit by bit swerving around crazier and crazier twists and turns, before reaching such over-the-top levels of bullshit I couldn't help but love the dedication and commitment. I'm honestly surprised the Switch was able to run half of this shit without exploding. It's a slow burn whose unique gameplay and increasing absurdity is a joy to get lost in. River City Girls is a side-scrolling beat-em-up developed by WayForward and Arc System Works and a spin-off of the Kunio-kun series, where you play as Misako and Kyoko as they take to the streets to save their boyfriends. And right off the bat, this game's aesthetic is absolutely gorgeous. From the cutscenes, whether full-blown or panel-based, to the designs of the characters, bosses, and even the shopkeepers, to the pixel art. Oh my god, the pixel art! It's also vibrant and expressive. It's a visual feast for the eyes that I could just gush about all day long. And its gameplay is just as solid. It's heavily based around building up ridiculous combos to wipe out the wide swaths of enemies that stand in your way, and whose mean streets are filled with plenty of weapons and items to take advantage of, and special attacks to unlock. Though I did have a lot of trouble getting into the swing of things. I'm not much of a beat-em-up person in the first place, and with this game in particular, its gameplay felt like it had a much weirder pace than what I'm used to, where it's just fast enough for my brain to assume I can go ham, but just slow enough that it completely derails my usual approach. It requires you to take your time and pay attention, particularly to your and your enemies' animations and timings. It's almost rhythmic in a way, but once I was able to get into that groove, it was smooth sailing. It's a great-looking game of punchy combat I absolutely adore. Summer Nights is the newest animated music video from Sayame, and animated by Rudoko, which follows a bunch of teens heading into an abandoned mall for shenanigans. Its direction has a nostalgic quality, with the super smooth slow-mo, bright colors and references to 90s shit that ties in nicely with these group of friends seemingly grown distant, reconnecting and reminiscing about the good old days. It's a cool video with an oddly specific experience to convey. In that same vein of visual communication, a story that repeats Evangelion's visual poetry is an AMV that clips together all of the repeated imagery from the classic anime whose only context comes from its description. Sometimes a repeated shot is a budget cut, and sometimes it's not. This well-organized compilation shows off the series' use of symbolism and how it almost rhymes throughout, in a way that's not only aesthetically pleasing, but which manages to say so much about the series so concisely. It's a clever video that does a lot with a little. 
If there's one thing I appreciate in a video essay, it's when just as much attention has been given to its editing as its writing, in which Piguni, especially in his recent retrospective Tomb Raider The Perfect Horror Game, does in spades. It's a creatively fueled analysis that uses the medium for some fantastic visuals that add to its lighthearted tone, and gets across his points about the game and the strange qualities it's taken on over time, more clearly without feeling cluttered. He even made a follow-up going into detail about how he actually made it. It's one of those videos that demands full attention when watching, and that I think it more than well deserves. But if you're looking for something less intense, more existential, and also weirdly specific, the speed and stillness of being online from the channel What's So Great About That takes a look at our society's obsession with brevity and length in media over time, the way it's manifested in this modern age of memes, and the cultural anxieties and relief surrounding this increasingly exponential escalation of content and the speed with which it's delivered to us. It's an interesting video that provides a lot of insight into the topic whose points often hit just a bit too close to home. And before you say it, don't worry, I'm already well aware of the irony of giving a video about our obsession with speed and slowness a brief recommendation in a long video. Scoobs and Shag is a webtoon that starts as a four-panel shitpost and develops into something completely different, and I'm not even fully sure how to properly describe what that different is. Sure, it has many elements in common with battle action anime, with its insane powers, leveling system, long stretches of exposition, and its top tier action, which makes effective use of its descending format to make every impact hit that much harder. But at the same time, there's a lot of comedy to be found in seeing all these classic cartoon characters being thrust into a setting so far removed tonally from their original series, it's hard not to giggle a little. I mean, for fuck's sake. Scoob's superpower is just having a gun. I mean, it's more complicated than that, but still. And alongside all of that, it's also filled with jarringly dark and grotesque imagery that just makes my skin crawl. It's a weird mix of such different ideas and concepts that somehow manage to click together coherently. And I think the only way to understand what I mean is to read it yourself. Yeah, those are my thoughts. I'll be honest here, with how hectic the last few months, and especially this month, have been for me, I wasn't sure if I was going to be able to get this done at all. But here we are! For anyone at this point, I didn't have any spooky recommendations here, considering how close we are to Halloween. Don't worry, I got another project in the works for that most spooky of holidays. Anyway, let me know what you think. If you agree, disagree, why your top things of fall slash autumn 2019 were, what you're looking forward to in the next few months, etc. And thanks for watching. If you've enjoyed this and want to see more, then check out my last video, where I talk about the way Hoseki no Kuni uses CG visuals and imagery to set the stage for its haunting story of growth and loss. Or check out my video on Loving Vincent, and the many literal and figurative pictures it paints over the course of its 95 minute runtime. And don't forget to like, comment, share, and of course, subscribe to come fly with me. Hit the bell to stay notified, follow me on Twitter for more updates, ramblings, and poor attempts at humor, and hopefully, I'll see you later.